Hey, you guys. Long time no see. I haven't been on YouTube punishment this time. Um, <clears throat> my whole family just got sick. I'm actually, one second. I'm actually, ah, hold on. Sorry, I had to go off and clear my chest. I'm actually um, just coming back because my whole family's been sick. And Obsidian, you guys can go check out my uh, conversation with Obsidian over on his channel. Um, we haven't collaborated for maybe three years. I have a video over on this channel and I did a couple of his podcasts. And so yesterday I went over to Obsidian's channel and we just talked about um, things that are more off the beaten path. Probably a lot of things you guys would be interested in hearing my opinion on. So we talked a little bit about um, Derek Jackson. We talked a little bit about Kevin Samuels. We talked about the talking points that are popular in the manosphere, um, the relationship dynamics between Black men and Black women. So we talked about a lot of things that I don't talk about a lot on my channel. So that is, you know, definitely worth a listen if you guys want to go over there. But what I thought, um, and shout out to Obsidian for having me over, um, but what I thought was really interesting is, and I was actually really happy about this. So first of all, let me say, I am happy about this. I thought it was interesting that out of all the things that I said in that interview, the two most controversial subjects that people were like bothered by were my assertion that Black people are overwhelmingly poor um, I specifically used the word poverty. I said, and I used it in the context of the fact that I think high value mating conversations are a bit silly in a community where everybody is overwhelmingly impoverished. <laughs> and so that one statement was like super triggering. Half of the comments right now over there are based on the fact that I said this. A couple of people came up on the panel because they were bothered that I said this. You know, there were a couple of super chats, like people were really, really in denial about the fact that Black people don't have money. I will talk about specifically what was said, but I just thought that was interesting. And I actually am really happy about that because out of, you know, when we engage the manosphere the topics that are hot button topics are normally relationship topics. So I was actually really happy and I am really happy that the hot button topic wasn't about relationships. It was about black poverty. And that actually is something that I am thrilled about. I am so thrilled that out of all of the conversation, the thing that people really were going back and forth on was what is the meaning of poverty? Are Black people really poor? A lot, I saw one brother say, you know, Black people are overwhelmingly upwardly mobile. And they were using places like Atlanta to prove that point. Um, and I can't lie, like that was the thing that kind of really irritated me. Like I was going to lose my temper a little bit <laughs> because you guys know how frustrated I get when black people are delusional. Like that really frustrates me. I can talk about any topic, but there are some things that we're really delusional about. And you guys know a big part of my channel. Like if you go to my power playlist, a big part of my channel is trying in a loving way to get Black people to face the reality of Blackness, face the reality of some personality types in our community, face the reality of how we may have behaviors that are stereotypical and that do need to be corrected. And although it can be offensive when other people say it among ourselves, we need to be able to have honest conversations so that we can grow as a community. 
And you guys know that whether I'm talking to black men or black women or black people, that I get very upset when we get delusional. Like delusion really bothers me. That's why I always shoot straight. I shoot straight to women. I shoot straight to men. I shoot straight to black people. And I try not to make excuses. And I also try to hear all points of view. But at the end of the day, reality is reality, no matter who it is, right? And you guys know I kind of stick by that. If you watch my videos, you know that I stick by that. So I am happy that going over into the manosphere, and you know, Obsidian is one of the people that founded the manosphere. So that's deep in the manosphere that the biggest point of contention. Oh, one second, you guys. Sorry, I had to say goodbye to Mr. But the biggest point of contention was not about Black men and Black women. It was about Black poverty. And that actually makes me so happy because that means that the substance of the conversation was such that people were able to rally together under a topic that they felt was important that was not relationship-based. So I'm not knocking the disagreement um, but you know, I'm about to go in, right? <laughs> I appreciate the disagreement, but we're going to have a come to Jesus moment about this poorness of black people. <laughs> like we just really are. We're not like, there's no chaser with this. In fact, right now, before I get started, I have all of my sources and y'all, I was up all in Harvard papers I was all over the census. I I was pulling, there are a couple of like 20, 30 page research papers by reputable institutions. Like you guys know, they were like, you know, we you cite sources and facts here. And you guys know, I will cite a darn source. Like you want facts, you came to the right place. So I'm going to write now Refresh your pages. Paradise here. Refresh your pages, you guys. Because <laughs> right now, I am going to yeah. refresh your page. Hold on. I'm going to the edit video part of this. And I am right under. where I shout out the Zayek's Institute in the description box, I'm going to type the word sources <laughs> and I'm about to copy and paste all my sources, all of them. There's even a book. You know what I'm saying? They're not just links. This wasn't just Google. <laughs> There's even a book for you to buy. So nobody's going to be able to say that I'm not right. We're just going to accept reality today. That's what we're gonna do. We're going to look reality in the face, swallow our pride, and, and, and have a come to Jesus moment together. <laughs> That's what we're gonna have to do. So with that said, Thank you, Cassandra. Keep it a thousand, right? So with that said, let's go ahead and get into, you all know I love a PowerPoint presentation. Let's get into my PowerPoint presentation. Hold on, let me pull it up. Because, yeah, we need to have this conversation. This was not even, I have a set of videos I want to make before the new year is up now that I'm feeling better. And this was not on my list, but I was highly motivated. <laughs> I was highly motivated by the, the tantrums. All right. So I have titled this The Black Wealth Delusion. The Black Wealth Delusion. A peek inside of our collective denial about the reality of Black poverty. There is, I, I don't, 
I don't know what it is. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know what's wrong with black people. You would think that we weren't all black, that we all don't have black families and that we all don't literally see that black people are poor as a rule. You would think that we weren't at the bottom of the barrel of the financial hierarchy of the country. You would think that even if we look outside of America, despite Africa having so many natural resources, that the reality that black people on the whole are not actually capitalizing on that wealth. You would think that the reality that a small concentration of black wealth is not being hyper-focused on, you would think all of those things were not reality and that I just pulled it out of my butt that black people were poor and I was just saying stuff, <laughs> just to be saying stuff. But I wasn't. So, sorry, I was walking around with you guys. So let's get into it. I want to look at, be able to see my comments too. So let me log in on my other device so that I can see you guys on YouTube because I, I want to look at my PowerPoint, but I also want to see you guys and your comments. And I might open up the panel if there is significant pushback on this. All right. So when I was over on Obsidian's, a big part of what people were trying to argue against me on was the difference between the word poverty or the definition of the word poverty and whether that was indicative of actually being poor, okay? So I use the word poverty. I use terms like impoverished. And people were complaining because they were saying that is inaccurate. Most black people are not in poverty. The poverty threshold is I have it right over here, but that these aren't the numbers that were quoted. <laughs> but, but I put the poverty threshold up there and that um, this was not the case. And that was only indicative of 19%, basically almost 20% of the black population. And 20% of the black, black population is not most people. And I said, you know, that 20% that the CDC is reporting, I didn't say the word CDC because I thought we all knew what we were talking about. <laughs> like, because somebody commented, you know, it's only like 19%. And so because the person was quoting the CDC, I thought that we could all who were listening to the conversation, we were naturally going to discuss the CDC stats. Now, a lot of people were upset with me that I did not explicitly say the CDC, but it was a CDC, right? Now, the CDC considers people who are not the CDC, but the census, sorry, the census says that people who are in poverty are below the poverty line. I said, why are we arguing semantics? Because it, simply because a person has $1,000 more a year, which pushes them above the poverty line, doesn't mean they're not poor. And at the end of the day, to play semantics over the word poverty or poor, as if we don't know what a poor person is, is ridiculous. It doesn't negate my point. However, I am going to go to the U.S. Census because I want to show that the U.S. Census actually agrees with me. <laughs> the U.S. Census says that Irene is right. 
and that simply doing away with the word poverty doesn't mean Black people are not poor. So first I want to talk about a small article on money. And the article's titled is, Are You Poor? How Poverty is Defined. And it says the official metrics and figures don't tell the whole story. Our government's official definition of poverty has very little to do with the day-to-day -day lived experiences of many Americans, says Jeremy Rosen, director of the Economic Justice at the Shriver Center on Poverty Law in Chicago. For example, experts say that many people are working full-time jobs but cannot make ends meet due to medical bills, childcare expenses, and housing costs. I think we hear a narrative about a strong economy with very low unemployment, but what that tends to overlook in most cases is that so many people are technically employed but are working jobs that just don't allow them to earn enough money to pay for basic necessities. This is a little something we like to call the working poor. And I don't know why everybody's pretending that they've never heard of these things before. Those people may not fall under the poverty line, right? Those people may not fall under the poverty line, but they are poor. Now, now that I've said that, I'll go back to my presentation in a second. I want to go to the U.S. Census because the U.S. Census acknowledges this. This is the census's website. You see this? Census.gov. It says varying degrees of poverty, thinking beyond poor and not poor. This was written by Ashley Edwards, who is the Poverty Statistics Branch Chief. Now, when I was over in Obsidian's, this uproar and tantrum over the poverty line and how only 20% of Black people are under the poverty line. And I said, yeah, those people are under the poverty line. But there are people who are not under the poverty line that are poor. I know that Black people want to fixate on 20%, but more than 50% of Black people are poor. More than 50%. Almost 60% of Black people in the United States are poor. So we are on the U.S. Census's website where the Poverty Statistics Branch Chief has written an article she is the poverty statistics branch chief. Those statistics that everybody wanted to argue about. And she's literally creating an article called Degrees of Poverty Thinking Beyond Poor and Not Poor. Because the poverty line is a statistic that is used to administer governmental services. To determine how much and what type of public aid people can get. That has nothing to do with who is poor. That's why it's below the poverty line. But that doesn't mean that you're not poor. So it says the concept of poverty is often interpreted as a state of being poor or not poor. However, identifying one population as poor and everyone else as not poor oversimplifies the economic circumstances individuals and families face over the year. Shut the front door. No. Do you mean that the poverty statistics branch chief at the United States Census Bureau agrees with me that simply throwing out the poverty line and then saying, okay, well, you're, they're not under the poverty line. They're not poor is idiotic. That that's not reality. Right? And then she goes on to talk about, you guys can read this article yourself. I'll make sure that I link it. She goes on to talk about how, although the Census Bureau, now mind you, this is the Statistics 
Poverty Statistics Branch Chief goes then to throw their statistics under the bus and says, yo, sure, we have this poverty rate because we need to administer stuff to people under the poverty line. But we also have an income to poverty ratio that paints a clearer picture of degrees of being poor. It is not just as simple as our poverty line. This is what the U.S. Census says about its own statistics. This is what the U.S. Census Poverty Statistics Branch Chief says about her own work on their website. We're back at the U.S. Census, census again because I, I need before I get back to my PowerPoint to establish that we're not going to place semantics over who is below the poverty line or not, as if that's evidence that black people are not poor. We're not gonna use the US census and a 19% below the poverty line rate to make believe that black people have money. <clears throat> Sorry, you guys know I'm getting over a cold that we don't have. So this is again, the US census about the supplemental poverty measure. And it goes on to discuss the supplemental poverty measure. The official poverty measure, which has been in use since the 1960s, estimates poverty rates by looking at a family or individual's cash income. The new measure is, more, is a more complex statistic incorporating additional items such as tax payments, work expenses, and its family resource estimates. No way. So rather than just looking at income, we're looking at what people can do with that income. And if they are effectually poor by way of what they can or cannot do with that income or what is draining their income. Thresholds in the new measure are derived from consumer expenditure survey expenditure data on basic necessities, food, shelter, clothing, and utilities, and are adjusted for geographic differences. This is what I said on Obsidian's. I said, it's stupid to talk about six figures when six figures doesn't mean anything in many places. That I know whole lawyers who have four and five roommates in Oakland Hills. Because it is not just about a number, it is about what you can do with money. And black people are poor. So for us to get into conversations about high value relationships and black people with money is literally idiotic. Because black people overwhelmingly have no money. And everybody, not everybody, but many people, most people were upset and enraged that I said this about black wealth and wanted to try to get upset because the U.S. Census says only 20% of black people are under the poverty line. They were asking ridiculous questions that I refused to address like, well, what is the point of the poverty line if people can be poor above the poverty line? Well, the U.S. Census is telling you why. It says, unlike official poverty thresholds, the new thresholds are not attend intended to assess eligibility for government programs. That's why there's a poverty line, because it creates a line where people can get more public benefits versus people getting less public benefits. It is not a line to determine who is poor. There are poor people who live above the poverty line. Even the US Census acknowledges this. Let's go to yet another US Census report. We're still on the US Census website. How the Census Bureau measures poverty. And it goes on to say, 
even when we are doing our official measurements of poverty for the sake of administering public aid, we cannot determine everybody's poverty, poverty status. There are a number of things that prevent us from even accurately calculating who is below the poverty line so that there are more people even below more than that 20%, that 19% who are below the poverty line. But none of that is really relevant because even the U.S. Census Bureau says, hey, there are poor people who are not below the poverty line. We have to consider if people's needs can be met with their income. There is, There are people who may not be below the poverty line, but who are effectually poor. And I say to Black people, that is the Black community. Poor. You're poor, you're poor, you're poor. But let's get into some more stats, because I don't think that we have really had the come to Jesus moment we need to have. I just want to, I just wanted to get over the argument of semantics, delusional arguing of semantics. You know, people who are delusional, so they want to argue over the definition of poverty rather than facing reality that you are overwhelmingly part of a poor demographic if you're Black. So collective Black narcissistic delusion. I want to start here because there is, in my opinion, when it comes to this topic, a collective narcissistic delusion among Black people. When I think about paternalism and the historic idea that Black people are proverbial children that need collective parental guidance, discussions like Black wealth cause me concern. A refusal to acknowledge a threatening, uncomfortable, or inconvenient truth is developmentally normal. Being in denial is a developmentally normal trait. However, it is an unconscious defense mechanism of early childhood. That should not be the behavior of an adult. So my question is, what does it mean when a large section of Black people engage in collective denial? According to psychologists, and this is a direct quote, like shock, short-term denial can function as a temporary protection against the full impact of something that is painful or overwhelming. But ongoing denial in adulthood a defining trait of pathological narcissism becomes a choice to engage in distortions of reality. And my question, people, is are you engaging in a choice to distort reality because reality is too painful or overwhelming for you to face? Are you engaging in ongoing denial of the truth because it makes you feel bad to face the truth. Psychologists go on to say, unless a person is experiencing a psychotic break from reality, as can happen with schizophrenia, people with narcissistic personality disorder know the difference between fact and fiction, truth and lies. The people who were arguing me down about if Black people were poor, they know the truth. You people know that Black people are overwhelmingly poor. You're not crazy. But because their personality structure is built around an inflated self-importance, designed to scaffold unstable self-esteem. They hold reality at a distance and filter information to conform to their wishes. 
the narcissist denial becomes a kind of self-deception in which accurate perception is ignored and replaced with preferred distortions. Such distortions can range from subtle misrepresentations to unrecognizable alterations of reality, end quote. Frankly, the aforementioned describes the Black community's perception of their wealth. Collective progress and poverty perfectly. Narcissistic delusion. That is what I was up against. And we are going to break down the walls of delusion today. That is what is for sure going to happen. Are there Blacks who are living in a fantasy world of delusion? One of the many, many, many sources that I posted in the description box, <coughs> most of the many, many, many sources that I posted in the description box that I want everybody who saw me on Obsidian and disagreed with me about Blacks and them being poor especially the brother who actually had the audacity to say that most black people are upwardly mobile. Like that was epic delusion. Not most black people being upwardly mobile, sir. <clears throat> I encourage you to read a paper that I attached. And I took this little picture from it. This paper was written by the Institute of Policy Studies and Prosperity Now. It says if the racial wealth divide is left unaddressed, medium black household wealth is on a path to hit zero by 2053. Baby, in just over 25 years, they said the average black household income will be zero. You know what they didn't say? Black people are on a path, an, an, upper, uh, an upwardly mobile path. Now explain to me if black people aren't, more, aren't, aren't poor overwhelmingly, how we are on a path to zero wealth by 2053. I encourage you to go to my description box and actually read the sources because everybody wants you to cite sources, but very few people actually go and check out the sources. Because reading this paper alone, not to mention all the other sources that I put in the description box, but this paper alone is a reality check. Okay? I think writer and researcher Antonio Moore said it best. I'm going to quote Antonio. You know, a black man. For a generation of blacks, celebrity exceptionalism. Oh, oh, wait, before I read this, they were also upset with me for saying that the majority of black wealth is concentrated in athletes and entertainers. Some people were really pressed. And I kept saying it because I know that athletes and entertainers are making black people delusional. So I kept repeating that the concentration of black wealth is athletes and entertainers. But don't worry, baby, I got some real stats to prove that point. But before we get there, before we get there, I want to go back to quoting a black man, a researcher and a writer named Antonio Moore. For a generation of blacks, celebrity exceptionalism and its results have been confused with, the ec with economic progress or the lack thereof that has been achieved by the black race as a whole since the days of the civil rights movement. This approach has come to create an escape for far too many black people. One which vision boards on bedroom walls filled with quotes of overcoming odds from wealthy African-American celebrities proves more important than their very own real economic struggles of the moment. Antonio called this phenomenon the decadent 
Vale, where a small group of wealthy black entertainers are shown repetitively in media and skew the perceptions of black reality. I could not have put it better myself. I could not have put this better myself. Let's just get into some fast facts. I have visuals. Fast facts. African Americans, Americans own almost none of America's land and possess negligible amount of America's wealth. When you deduct the family car and other depreciating assets from a black family's worth, half of all black American households, which account for 7 million families of three, have a total net worth of less than $1,700. No, how can black people not be poor if half of all black households have less than $1,700 of net worth. Explain it to me. <clears throat> anybody. I would like anybody to explain to me how a group of people where 50%, 50% of their families have less than $1,700 of net worth are not poor. Explain to me why debating this topic became the hot button point of conversation of, of all of the commentary I made yesterday. This really ticked people off. People are actually upset that I've pointed this out. Now, remember, I pointed it out in the context of having conversations about high value mating and dating choices is stupid to me because black people are poor. A bunch of poor people getting together to talk about who wants a six figure person and who's got six figures is idiotic because you don't have six figures. You're poor. Half of our households have less than $1,700 of net worth. So it's stupid for us to get together in hordes to discuss rich people problems. Why don't we get some reality in our minds first before we start endlessly debating on YouTube about arguments that do not apply to 99% of the people having the conversation? That was my only point yesterday. And everybody got up in arms because I said black people are poor. Nah, you're poor. You're poor. So these conversations are literally fantasy. Fantasy. You're living in a fantasy. To argue about something that does not apply to you is a fantasy. For every second person to come up and claim that they have tons of money is BS. You're lying. You are lying. Statistics show that the probability of you being a liar is 90%. <clears throat> and this is why I started a vlog channel. So we knew it was no cap when I speak. But just because it doesn't, it doesn't apply to me does not mean that it doesn't apply to the majority of black people. And I recognize that. And I don't say that to shame Black people. I say that because a repeated cycle of delusion will prevent us from progressing. If we refuse to accept reality, it's like the Black father statistics. How many Black people did not grow up with their father? How many Black people do you know that did not have a father in the home? Did not have an active father? We let a sample size of a couple hundred black men 
make us avoid the reality that we need to fix our families. That is enraging. We let embarrassment about being poor make us not want to face the reality that we need to do something to improve our socioeconomic state as a people. We are so embarrassed by the state of our community that we slip into denial every time somebody tries to bring facts to the table because we don't want to think of ourselves that way. We don't want to look in the mirror and behold our natural faces. We'd rather be delusional and argue over the definition of the poverty line. When half of our households have a net worth of under $1,700. Let's talk about where money is made. Because something else somebody said, you know, in a separate part of the conversation, I was talking about hypergamy. And... People, like I said, were upset that I said Black people were poor. People were upset that I said Black wealth is concentrated amongst athletes and entertainers. And they wanted to claim that somehow there were Black people who were not athletes and entertainers earning money. And this is what I said. I said, I look at Mr. So I'm third generational Black wealth, right? But Mr. is first generational black wealth. He's the generation that made money. He is the most educated person in his family. He has two master's degrees. He has a, a doctorate. And he literally carries his family. That is the reality of black wealth. It's like Highlander. There can only be one in a family most of the time. And that person is carrying the weight of the poor people in their family. And so this person said, on one hand, she says that black people are poor. On the other hand, she says, Mr. has two, doc uh, two, two master's degrees, two doctorates or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I said it. Are you insinuating? that most black wealth is concentrated in the white collar sphere because Bloomberg disagrees with you. According to Bloomberg, only 1% of the S&P 500 CEOs are black with African-Americans making up a mere 2.6% of positions where they may become the next head of one of these major companies. White males and white women collectively hold nearly 90% of these top spots, which are the type of positions that make the most money in America. The exceptions prove the rule. That was my point. The exceptions prove the rule. They do not make the rule, they prove the rule. Now, I don't know if it's because I don't speak like I'm writing a text. I don't know if it is because I tend to use longer sentences and actual paragraphs when I talk. But somehow, the simplicity of what I was saying was over the heads of a sizable portion of people. I wasn't speaking French. I was speaking English. I meant what I said. I want to talk about black millionaires. This non existent darn near class of black billionaires. Oh, we're about to break it down today, baby. We've already established 50% of black households have a net worth of under $1,700. Now let's go to the other end of the spectrum, the black millionaires. 
that people just really believe there are so many of them. I'm about to tell you exactly how many black millionaires there are. I'm going to tell you who they are and I'm going to tell you how they made their money so that we can get out of delusion. <clears throat> the survey for consumer finances and Brandy's research showed that even when considering all of the countable assets of black families, the pinky ring on your finger, the car in your garage, the furniture in your house, even when you consider every single thing a person can count as an asset. Less than 1% of black people have over $1.4 million in net worth. That is in contrast with 10% of white families holding the same amount of wealth. Or in simpler terms, 8 million white homes versus a few hundred thousand black homes. And apparently all hundred thousand of those people are here on YouTube talking about high value dating. A few hundred thousand. There are 17 to 18 million black people in this country. Only a few hundred thousand of them live in households that have more than $1.4 million. A few hundred thousand out of many, many millions. I want you to really lock that in. I want you to lock it in. Baby, lock that into your mind. Because that's all of their assets. That's not even the money they have. That's their house. That's their car. That's the pinky ring on their finger, like I said. That's every asset that they have. That's if we are extremely, amazingly, unbelievably gracious in our definition of an asset. That is if we are very, very, very generous in our definition of an asset. Thank you. Let's move on. Athletes, entertainers, and debt, the black 1%. Because let's just talk about people who do have a little bit of change. Those people that, the, so, okay, so there's only a few hundred thousand families out of 17 million who, who actually have over $1.4 million. If we count everything, including the kitchen sink. But let's talk about what those people look like. What's really going on with those people? Let's talk about that. So 96.1% of the 1.2 million households in the top 1% are white. A total of about 1,150,000 households with a median net, a median net asset worth of $8.3 million. In contrast, black households of the same demographic make up 1.4%. And get this, what 16,800 homes, 16,800 homes, baby. That's all. Millions and millions of black people, 16,800 homes. If that's not sobering enough, not only is it only 16,800 homes, but 
their white counterparts have an average of $8.3 million. Black people in this demographic have an average of $1.2 million. And that is only 16,800 black homes. I, I want this to really sink in. That means only a few thousand of the 14 million, think about this, African-American households have more than $1.2 million in assets. Only a few thousand of 14 million households. Blacks comprise 14% of the U.S. population, but 1.4% of the top 1% of households. Even within that 1% of wage earners, there's a, dispar a disparity. Top earning black households have a medium income of around $900,000, which is 22% less than whites. About 67% of the top earning black households reported no industry. They aren't white collar workers. They're wealthy people that are drawing their income from investments. Finance, insurance, real estate, employment services, mining, construction industries only make up 2% of black earners. I want you to hear me. Black people in finance, black people in insurance, black people in real estate, black people in employment services, the mining industry, construction industries, they only make up, these are the blue collar wealth. They only make up 2% of black earners. So who makes up the bulk? You might ask yourself, who are the people who represent the majority of this small, small, teeny tiny group of people? Well, actors and entertainers and sports people, athletes, and entertainers, exactly what I said yesterday. People who are writing books, people who are entertainers, they're in the performing arts, people who are, who are in what they call spectator sport industries, football, basketball, account for almost 40% of the top earners. The top earners, the ones who have big money, not the ones who have 1.2 million, not the ones who have 900,000, but the ones that have multiple millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, or billions. So I reiterate that the concentration of black wealth is held by athletes and entertainers because we're poor. And even those people can't carry us because even among the wealthiest blacks, they are barely scraping the ceiling. So what about non-millionaires? What about non-millionaires? We've talked about 50% of black households are only earning are only have a net worth of $1,700. We've talked about how it's estimated by 2053 that the medium income of the black family will be zero. In just over 25 years, they anticipate our overwhelming net worth, that medium is gonna be zero. We've talked about how there are almost no black households with more than $1.4 million. We've talked about how even in that small percentage, which represents just a few hundred thousand families out of 14 million households, the majority of that wealth is concentrated with entertainers and athletes that only 2% of that wealth can actually be attributed to hardworking folk. And another portion of that wealth is based on investment. So what about all the people in the middle? What about this 
middle group. Effectually, we've talked about more than half of black people. So what about the rest of them? Relying on data from Credit Suisse and Brandeis, and Brandeis University's Institute of Assets and Social Policy, the Harvard Business Review article, this is Harvard now, How America's Wealthiest Black Families Invest Money reports this. A white family with $356,000 is in the 72nd percentile of white families. However, a black family with the same amount of money, $356,000, would be in the 95th percentile of black families. Let me put this in perspective. Black people are so poor that if you make a little over $300,000, you will be in the 95th percentile of all black people's income. It puts you automatically in the 95th percentile. Why? Because most black people are poor. Most black people are poor. In simpler terms, it means that 28% of the 83 million white homes or over 23 million white households have more than $356,000. While only 700,000, because y'all know I had to give you an exact number, of the 14 million black homes, only 700,000 of them have more than $356,000 because black people are poor. It's, it's just really important. And so we have some people that are, you know, because we're talking about these six-figure people, right? But six figures in the Black community doesn't mean anything because when you earn six figures, our ability to let our children live at that same social status is basically non-existent. Middle-income Black and Hispanic adults are more likely to move down to a lower-income tier than up. Let me repeat that. Middle-income and Black Hispanic adults, middle-income Black and Hispanic adults are more likely to move down to the lower-income tier than up. About half of upper income black and Hispanic adults slip down the income ladder in a typical year. In just one year, one fiscal year, they move down the economic ladder. And there's an even smaller percentage, but still notable, that move up, but most of them are moving down. Like literally six figures today, less than six figures tomorrow. And yes, Mama Kush was saying American poor, not even American black poor, to be poor in America is for sure not like being poor in a third world country. But we're in America, so we have to talk about American standards. Obviously, America, everybody is better off in America than in a third world country. That goes without saying. My daughters went to Mexico. I didn't show that on my vlog on our little family vacation, but we took the girls to Mexico. They were like, we want to leave. We weren't even in Mexico, y'all. I'm not even kidding. We were not in Mexico for 30 minutes. The girls were horrified and disgusted. They said literally, and I quote, we want to go back to America. 
They were shocked and appalled. Christian saw some guy laying on the street and he was a darker skinned Mexican. And Christian goes, why are the black people sleeping on the streets? Because, you know, this Mexican was the same color as him. He was horrified. They don't treat black people well here. He was, My children, we literally bought Takis and got a soda. And then they demanded to come back to America. We spent less than 30 minutes in Mexico. They were not filling it. So yes, American poverty hits different than the poverty of other countries. You got to love America. Like you couldn't pay me to leave. I will stay in America. The most I'll do is dual citizenship. I got to be able to come. I will not give up this American passport. That is fact. I'm not doing it. I don't even understand American people trying to make believe like there are better places. No, America is where it's at. Okay. So with that said, I will go ahead. I'll go ahead and open up the stream. <laughs> I mean, open up the panel. But this is all because, and again, shout out to Obsidian. I definitely appreciate Obsidian having me over. It was a great conversation. You guys can go over to Obsidian's channel and check it out. But yeah, the biggest debate that apparently I started over on his channel was about Black poverty. That really, that hit something in people. And again, I can really appreciate and I am actually really happy that the, the kind of the place where people were like, yeah, I want to talk about this more. I have feelings about this, that it wasn't relationship, relationship based, that it was based on something that affects us all, which is wealth or the lack thereof. So that was actually really cool to me. I think that's amazing. However, y'all know I'm not going to let that kind of delusion just rock. Okay. So I had, I had to make a video. Like I said, we needed to have a come to Jesus moment. Tracy said, that's what happened when I took our, my son to our Chinatown here in Toronto. He said, mommy, can we go back to Canada now? <laughs> yes, girl, my kids were like, can we leave? They did not like Mexico. I was so disappointed because I was so excited to show them Mexico and they just wanted to get back to the United States. They just were like, literally, and I'm not even joking. Several times since we took that vacation a few months ago, the kids have been on some America's so great, America's better than other places. We have it so good in America. <laughs> like their appreciation for America went shot up 10,000%. By that 30 minutes in Mexico, like they did not, they were not, they were not feeling that life anyway. So if you have an opinion other than what I have presented here, although, um, in my Ben Shapiro voice, facts don't care about your feelings or wait, Ben Shapiro talks fast. Facts don't care about your feelings. <laughs> you can... You can dislike what I said all you want, but I triple dog dare you to debunk it. Um, how do they really know if they only spent a half hour in Mexico? They don't, but they weren't willing, just that short period of time, they weren't willing to give it any more, any more consideration. They didn't want to stay. That's just the reality. They didn't want to stay. <clears throat> yeah yeah I believe it's psychologically damaging to see people like that I agree with you anyway well y'all if we're not gonna have a conversation I'm gonna leave if you guys aren't gonna mosey your little ways up here to have a conversation I'm about to take my previously, you know, and currently recovering 
sick self and I'm going to go relax. <laughs> We're supposed to have some icy rain or something. So it's a perfect day to turn on a fireplace and chill. The perfect time. Yeah, I agree with that. It is, it's not even that we're comfortable because I think to be comfortable in our state, we would have to admit that we're in that state. And based on the fact that the most inflammatory thing that I said over there was that black people are poor and that people wanted to squabble over the definition of poverty, Based on that, I don't even think that we are comfortable. I think we're just in full-blown denial. Like, we just don't want to face it. I mean, when somebody tells me that Black people are overwhelmingly upwardly mobile, I'm just like, that's a level of detachment from reality that I cannot. I just can't. I can't with that. I can't even do it. I can't do it. Octavia said I would come up, but I don't disagree. <laughs> you can come up if you agree, Oct Octavia. But I'll give you guys like two more minutes, but nobody can come up at the same time. And y'all know I would just go and relax. I'll go relax my mind and I'll prepare to do the other lives. Because like I said, I have a lot of lives I want to do before the new year. So um, I can also just work on those either they may not be lives they could be videos um or they could be lives i'm not sure yet i'm not sure how i'm gonna go for it mexico is doing more than most black countries oh let's not talk about the global state of black people let's not talk about the global state of black people i think the second thing i said that bothered people a lot and maybe I'll make a separate video about that was about, and this was not a topic I brought up. Um, I was asked to compare the desirability of black men to the desirability of black women. And I basically said, that's weird. I'm not going to do that. I'll just say that black people are the least desired, but black people are the least respected people in the world. I just think there was a lot of denial. It was like very crabs in a barrel to me because it's like, <laughs> Y'all know nobody respects us, right? Like, why are we sitting here the least respected, the, the least moneyed, with the least amount of power sitting and debating which one of us is liked more? It's like, y'all, oh my gosh. I couldn't with that. I was like, nobody respects us. <laughs> we, need, we need to tap into that understanding. We aren't respected. No, we're not. <laughs> we are the least respected. And, and that's, I, I called in because I can disagree with one little thing you said. And I was like, okay, that's my door to come in. It's really not big though. I mean, it's still in alignment with everything that you said, but, but I thank you for allowing me on, by the way. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. But um, you, you said that black people are, you know, it's more of a denial thing rather than us being comfortable. And, and I say it, we are comfortable like this because when I've seen it in my own family, my, my, fam my mother's family is from a small town in Southern Virginia. And to be anything other than a struggle bunny is you trying to be white. And so when... Oh. Mm. When when you say like, oh, I, you know, I want to go to college, I want to do this, they, their response is, oh, you want to be white. And somehow that is negative. And then, you know, being being anything but a struggle person is negative. And then you kind of get ridiculed for it. So it's like you, you they want to force you or we want to force other black people into being in a struggle situation because that is blackness to a lot of black people struggling poverty low education you know living month uh, paycheck to paycheck that is blackness 
and that seems to have that seems to be our culture and we don't want to do anything to mess that up we want to hold on to this cult. we're very proud it seems of this part of our culture and that's why i say that somehow we are comfortable like this Girl, I actually really agree with, you. I literally said the same thing and I was over there. I said, I, I said, and I, that's why Cassie, I put what you, what you typed up about being uppity. I said, <laughs> these terms, talking white, somebody there said I had a fake Valley girl accent and somebody else was like, no, that's how she talks. And I'm like, <laughs> that's just yeah. I'm like these, these ideas like talking white, being high sedity, being uppity, those aren't coming from the fact that we're all just upper middle class and upperly mobile. That's coming from the fact that we're poor. This is the yes. characters used to talk about people that are abnormal to us because they are not impoverished. And why are we sitting here make believing that y'all don't know what I'm talking about? That's what was frustrating. Like I was getting genuinely upset and was like, let's move on. I was, <laughs> getting, like, I was getting genuinely irritated people came up on the it's so to like, irritating I but it's like, also scary it's very concerning i was like this world of make-believe that y'all are living in y'all you guys are really gonna sit here and act like you don't know what i'm talking about that's what was frustrating to me like like i'm just talking out the side of my face and even if i didn't bring hardcore statistics you don't know like i'm black you're black we're gonna say yes black. we like, we're know. here like we our neighbors are our cousins like we're we're all seeing it where, where are you getting not you of course but where are our black people getting this grandiose uh, idea of ourselves from because it permeates every part of our lives you know you like black boys don't want to read because that would make them uppity that would that would separate them from the other boys they we we want to eat shit food because that is blackness having diabetes by age 50 that's a normal black people thing it's like yeah. it's we you know we want that that is completely normal we're not doing anything to avoid that from happening yeah i think um Ali said, I have stayed, I have to say this is very telling to me. I'm in my early 20s. I grew up in an, a, a middle slash upper class family, so I thought it wasn't rare. I will say I it depends on where you grow up. I grew up in San Francisco, so I was around a diverse group of people who were upper middle class. So I just thought, you know, anybody could be in our socioeconomic bracket, and I didn't have a lot of direct um, contact with people who are poor. I just didn't. And I had certain family members and I, I would guess like looking at it now, they were working poor, but they were, you know, like I have, you know, an uncle and an aunt, my uncle passed away recently who owned a little store, but it was, a, you know, it was a little store, I guess, in a poor area, but all of the black people there were like homeowners. Um, I'm Gullah Geechee. So a lot of my family have land and, and I guess in my mind, those were poor people. But then when I really met poor people, because remember I told you guys, like among certain classes of black, there are certain behaviors that are like normal to them, but are like very jarring if you're not from that socioeconomic status. So like, um, there's a habit of like kind of yelling at people or being like really what I read as aggressive when you're mm -hmm, talking, mm -hmm. almost to the point where you think like, do we have a problem? Are we, are we fighting? <laughs> I didn't and it, that was like a real like thing where I, I had to learn like, no, that's how a whole group of black people, that's how they talk. And they're not being aggressive and they actually get offended. If you say that, that's like just the normal mode of communication for them. Um, where there's, there's, I know whole groups of black people where domestic violence or just violence in general are considered very normal. The first time I heard, you know, a guy, he was from, uh, from East Oakland and he was just talking about, this is before like, um, Lake Merritt and all that was gentrified. And he was like, yeah, you know, and 
he just is gonna you know smack her upside the head and i'm just in the way the casual way he discussed like domestic violence i was just like this is <laughs> this is really fascinating i'm like you just said that really i literally said it to him i said you just said that like past the butter. He's like, yeah, it happens all the time. You know, these bitches get out of line. We just, <laughs> I'm like, oh. Or he was talking about how the police come and we just start running. I'm like, you just run even though you're not doing anything. He's like, yeah, you see the police, you start running. And I was just like, wow, this is freaking fascinating. So I believe you, Allie, that you didn't think it was abnormal. And that's why I was saying yesterday to move up to social classes, if you're a woman practicing hypergamy, is pretty much the limit of what is reasonable. Because after that, it is a culture shock. Like you're walking into a situation of people who are nothing like you. And it's like a very different thing. But for people to pretend now, you know, in my old age, I know that my family's experience or my experience, like, you know, recently we had a family member die and it took almost three years to close that estate out. Three years to close that estate out. That's not a, an experience I recognize that most Black people have. Uh -huh. We're not doing that. So, you know, I think I recognize that as the reality. That's why I said I don't have a dog in this race, but I'm not going to sit here and make believe like, the life I live now, which I'm not a multi I, asset wise, maybe, but, but I don't have just millions upon mil millions of dollars sitting in my account, but I live a very comfortable life. I recognize that that is abnormal when we do uh, not just working with the Institute, but you guys know that Mr. Works with like black youth from kindergarten all the way up to college level. And when I engage those young black people, we are a phenomenon to them. That is a phenomenon. Saying doctor, somebody before a black person's name, that's sometimes the first time they've seen that. So I'm not going to sit here and make believe like it's a commonplace thing. And I don't think it's healthy in our community for a small section of black people to make believe like they are representative of the whole. I would love it. But before we accept that that's not the truth, we can't improve anything. I just don't know what we're supposed to do at this point. I mean, like you have children, you can teach your children properly. I teach my children properly. My daughter, I only have one child and, and we listen to you together sometimes. And I, but I don't know how to help the collective. My cousins have so many children in my generation and I don't see it being much better for them. And it, it really truly worries me. It really does. I'm really worried because my, you know, our children are going to be adults with these children. I don't see it changing. In fact, I kind of see it getting worse. Like, I don't know if y'all have noticed that our music has gotten significantly more terrible. Um, yes. I, I don't like, is, do we have like, a, are we like, I mean, you, well, if the Institute, the Institute is helping. That is true. Yeah. Which, <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up because another, and I might make a separate video about this. Something else that came up is there was a young brother who came up and he was really disheveled. Like, and I'm not coming for him, but he started talking and I was just very distracted by his appearance. And I was also surprised by it. Right. So he had like on a baseball cap with like the sticker on and a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. His face was just really not shaven. His environment didn't look the nicest. And he was talking and I said, you know, I don't necessarily disagree with what you're saying, but like your presentation is like throwing me off. Right. And then I brought, and then later on Obsidian was like, um, I think we were talking about, he brought up Cynthia because y'all know I can't go anywhere without somebody bringing up Cynthia. And I was basically like, you know, the truth of the matter, I like Sin. So I'm very fond of her and we agree on some things and we disagree on others. Um, but if people don't like her, like that's not really my problem. You know what I'm saying? I'm not here to pick who I associate with based on your feelings. Um, but he goes, I can't think of any, you know, black man that she supports. And I was like, I can think of a black man she supports. And he was like, who? And I said, Q better. 
right? I said, I think mm -hmm. in almost every video she advertises this institute. And I can think of other Black men that she supports. She's like really just action oriented when it comes to Black men. And he said, well, Q Butter kind of looks like this brother over here that you were saying his presentation kind of throws you off. And I was like, yeah, but even Q Butter acknowledges that the way he presents causes people to judge him. The difference between Q and this gentleman is that Q is doing work. Yes. So he is an exception to the rule. He does not prove the rule. He is an exception. He can show up however he wants. I could care less. I know for the past four years, going on five years, that he has touched the lives of literally hundreds of families, that he puts in work every day. The man doesn't sleep. So it doesn't matter to me what he looks like, <laughs> I said, but the first words out of his mouth weren't a critique of Black women or a critique of Black men or some BS. The first words out of his mouth to me were, hey, yo, I'm opening up this school. I'm, this is my cue better impression. <laughs> yo, sis, <laughs> you know, I'm opening up this, this institute. Do you want to volunteer? And my immediate response was, of course, I'll do anything I can to help. And I respected that as well, because it wasn't on some BS. The thing he had to say to me was, I'm about my purpose. Are you willing to be on purpose too? And of course I got with that. So that was another point of contention there was this I, um, kind of identity politics thing. And I said, this is interesting because if a woman came up here fat, filthy with a bonnet on, it wouldn't matter if she spoke truth to power. Right. If I see a pissy drunk on the street, you're sitting in a pile of your own urine and you're dead drunk. You could give me the most solid life advice on earth for us to pretend that presentation doesn't matter is like, come on now. Like it does. It does affect how people receive you. Um, and I know that was another place where I noticed like a little bit of cognitive dissonance. <laughs> Like we're, 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 like, we're like people were embracing that. <laughs> One thing, and, and I've kind of asked you this before on it with another subject. Oh, uh, it was, um, it was, do, do black mothers emasculate their sons? And I called in on that. And I, and I don't think I asked properly, but perhaps because I, I really trust your judgment, Miss Irene. And, and in a, even in my own family, um, you know, there's just not a lot of mental and emotional support uh, for for being every, anything but standard black, if you will, which is what we're talking about, like this low standard of what blackness is. And so, perhaps, maybe, please, in a further in the in the future, could you like make some kind of guideline for our? I have a daughter, but I have cousins that are boys. I, I really would like some guidance in how to engage them and in how to help them not be what they look like they're going to become. And I'm, I'm really worried about them and I don't know what to say and do for them. And if, if, there, if you could like, I don't know, like a pamphlet or something, because I, I need I need advice. I don't know where to turn to to get through to them, especially as a woman too. Like I'm not a man, and you know they're really macho boys. I don't I don't know what to say to them, but I don't like where they're going. Yeah, that's hard, right? So first, I want to go back to, and I'm pretty sure this is what I said the last time. Do black mothers emasculate their sons? Well, not mm -hmm. every black mother, because obviously I can't speak in totality, but I think it's extremely common for, um, for single mothers to emasculate little boys mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in many ways, right? Um, I think that's why, and I've said this before, and, and I'll, I know this doesn't sit well with a lot of women, a woman should never be left alone to raise a child. And even if she's trying her best, it's just not a good situation. It's something that um, and especially a little boy, I think that balance, and I think the same thing goes for men. There are things that women bring to the situation of parenting that are very needed 
And there are things that men bring to the situation of parenting that are also essential. And there's a balance um, that plays out much better if there are two parents in the home of the opposite sex. Yes. Because, you know, women can be over. So emasculation can look a lot of ways. Women can be over like overly gentle Mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of wanting that boy to process his emotions and wanting to kind of smooth over and hug and kiss everything away constantly. Um, not wanting any aggressiveness, things like that. And I think they can also, in the way that they speak, just be blatantly disrespectful without understanding that that boy has to grow up to be a man. And so if you are constantly speaking to him, I don't want to say in an authoritative way because you're like a a parent, but in a way that is demeaning, that's not enhancing what needs to blossom into his manhood, that can be very um, emasculating and men will normally step in, like stop babying that boy. Right. Or, you know, don't cry. Mm. Or, you know, don't <laughs> rush handle them more. Do you know what I mean? And we, I have a problem with that. Like sometimes I'm looking like, Oh my gosh, this is kind of harsh. You know what I mean? Or, you know, I'm clutching my pearls because I think something is too rough, but that interaction with manhood is what they need. Right. Yes, yes. But we don't have a lot of the real manhood. And that's when, I'm, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're at a loss. Yeah. And I mean, that's why I think it's so important to find, I'm sorry, I'm just getting over cold. Oh, yes, me too. Everybody, everybody is these days. I'm, um, my, my sinuses keep getting clogged up. So I I'm trying to like clear them without being gross. Um, So that's why I think, I mean, this is hard because so many of us are already in imperfect situations. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. We're already in the poop. Like what do we do since we're here? We're here. We can't get out of it. It's it's we're we have to accept being in poop. How do we navigate this the best way possible? Yes. Yes, definitely. Um, Right. And that 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 becomes so difficult because I would say it's always important if you can to work it out with the child's father. Mm. Um, And then I would say I would encourage women to get married. Right. Get married so that there is a male presence always there. And if you can't do that, then try to have a good relationship with the child's father so that that boy can have that influence if the child's father maybe is living a lifestyle that's not, I'm so sick, <laughs> that's not conducive to um, a healthy environment for the child, then I would look for a mentor, a okay. family okay. member that can take them under their wing. Like it's hard because mm-hmm. the reality is- That like, is so hard because my family, like the dudes in my family, even my grandmother's generation, they're just a bunch of poop heads. Like they, yeah. we don't have it over here. We just don't have it in my family. And it's really concerning. Yeah, that's the thing too. That's why sometimes we have to look like outside of our families mm-hmm. and like just link up with brothers that are doing good work. And that- And I think as women, we have to be open with that too, because like Mr. has his whole mentoring organization. And that really does mean that he spends a lot of time with single mothers, right? And if Mm. I were horribly insecure, you know, I would like not like that. Like to mentor, that mentor has to engage the child, but also has to engage the child's family. And a lot of times if you're black, that's going to be a mom. So as women, we have to obviously respect boundaries with other women, but we also have to, as the woman in the relationship of a man who wants to take black boys under his wing, we have to leave that door open. And we have to recognize like if, if you're the greater good, the greater good significant other, if your husband is everything that he ought to be, everything you signed up for then you know where his heart is and you have to embrace those sisters. You have to embrace their babies, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's where we start looking like outside of our 
maybe familial circle if we don't have that black male leadership there and then trying to get our sons linked up with black men that are leaders. So, you know, that could be finding, I know a lot of professors um, will be able and will like often embrace, um, there are black student unions. So getting your child in, involved in a black student union, that will normally help them link with a lot of brothers that are putting in good work in the community. And then from mm -hmm. there, just make sure you're networking with those adults to find out who you can link with to have a safe place for your child. And then in all of these things, you know, always looking out for the protection of your children, because where there is a woman who's vulnerable and looking for help for that little boy, there's a predator, right? right. So there's like that balance of seeking help, but also not just kind of taking the reins off of your child and trusting them with anybody. Um, because that could also lead to, to harm. That becomes a, such a difficult situation. But I would also say then raising those boys, those sons and daughters that you have to have a family-oriented mindset so that the buck stops with us, the buck stops with you, right? That mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they know this is not the life that you want. You keep your family together. You stay chaste until you find somebody that you want to reproduce with, that you want to marry, and just raising our children like better values as well so that we don't have to generationally have to help people navigate in mass like these difficult situations. But yeah, that's that's really, really difficult. Thank you, Real Deal Financial. But yeah, that Thank is- Thank you. Yeah, it's a really- that's like a really difficult one. It really, it really is. It's it's quite heartbreaking, really. Um, and and I and you know the years go by because they're they're about my daughter's age. My daughter is eight, and as they get older, especially the oldest one, he's become very aggressive, very defensive for very little things. And and if I yeah, and Boy Scouts too, right? Have you? I don't trust Boy Scouts because there's a lot mm -hmm. of homosexuality and perversion going on. Mm -hmm. Scouts, so that's not a vibe for me. But yeah, mm -hmm. the, the some of that is like the natural part of just like growing as a young boy too, right? Because mm -hmm. like say, for example, for girls, you know, the being emotional, the kind of being cutty, the kind of testing boundaries, like in a feminine way. That is something that I'm experiencing like with my daughters and then like just kind of working with them and talking them through like that womanhood, like that that transition into womanhood. And mm -hmm. I think boys go through like the same thing. And there are for sure things that happen like to the male body, hormonal changes that they have and things like that. And I don't know what that's like. You're just not going to get it. Like you're just, I don't know it. I don't know. <laughs> I that right I and there might the way that I approach it is obviously not going to be coming from a place of any true understanding so right right they, mm -hmm. like I don't get it yeah <laughs> and some of those attitudes like the way that men handle attitudes like that is like I've actually seen men kind of kind of like get up on like a teenage boy or like an adolescent boy, like, you know, who do you think you're talking to like that and stuff like that? And I'm like, oh my gosh, right? But a lot of times what I hear from men is they have to learn what it's like when you move like that, how men deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. So they are approaching them with like, I'm also establishing a hierarchy of manhood and I'm showing you how to do this. Also women, we demonstrate a lot of emotionality, which is not a negative thing. Like emotions are our superpower and our Achilles heel as women. But without a man, because a lot of times like with my little, little one, because you guys know I only have one boy left in the household now, which is my youngest. Um, he'll like behave in certain ways because he's stuck here most of the day with me and two other girls. And what I will say um, to him is when I see him kind of mimicking like hyper emotional behavior, I'll always go, do you ever see your big brother acting that way? Or do you ever see, you know, Mr. Acting that way? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, that's because men and women are different. And like men, they don't like women. And I'll literally say it. I'll like women, we will yell and like, get emotional, like slam doors and stuff. 
I'm like, but men don't really do that, right? So don't copy us. Like go to the men and ask them how they handle their anger and stuff. But without they... right, but without a man there to demonstrate mm -hmm. how men emote versus how women emote, and for without that comparison live every day in the house, yes, without, without you ticking off your husband, right? And him sitting there and watching how he basically dismisses you or doesn't even respond, then he, as a young man, never learns the skills. And what ends up happening is you have little boys that are, or young men, right? And little boys that are emoting mm -hmm. and reacting like women, but it hits different when it's a boy. Yes. We're saying, yes. Like, oh my gosh. No. <laughs> When he punches a hole in the wall, because no girl would really do that, right? <laughs> but he'll be frustrated and throw what, throw something across the room, break his remote, or punch a hole in the wall. And we're like, oh my gosh, he punched a hole in the wall. This is crazy. But because he's emoting like a woman, but he's really a little blossoming man. Mm -hmm. And so it hits so much different. So that's why you got to get a man involved. You need a man there. Yeah, you mm -hmm. need a man Involved. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel I'm not going to get through to them. I and I and I appreciate that. That's what I need. I need to not for myself. I, I'm not dating or anything, but I need to find them a man. I have yes. Okay, that's I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. And I'm gonna let you go. I've wait. I've used up enough of your time. But thank you so much. I appreciate that very very much. No, I love that you came up. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye, everyone. Hi, Octavia. Octavia. Can you guys hear Octavia? Is it just my, I can't hear her. Octavia? Oh no, I can't hear you, Octavia. If you are talking, I cannot hear you. I'm going to remove you and let you come back in. I'm going to have to remove Octavia. But anyway, yeah. Um, oh, you guys couldn't hear her? Okay. Yeah, I couldn't hear her either. I'll give her a second to come back up. And if anybody else wants to come up, otherwise, I'm going to shake the spot. Um. I'll just wait a couple minutes and then if y'all are done talking, I am done talking as well. But I hope that this live stream, you know, I, you guys know, I tend to get really frustrated when I'm in a conversation and I feel like, how can I put this? When, when we are in denial, that is frustrating to me. A huge part of my content is to challenge people to assess themselves. Like I have that video, Slave, I Found You, and I start talking about the mentality of a slave. And then I challenge people to ask themselves, based on what slaves say about themselves, what these enslaved people said about themselves, are you exhibiting some of these behaviors? Are these common behaviors that are still prominent in our society? And, you know, I've done some pretty salacious things like pulled up old racist memorabilia and been like, is there any truth to this racist memorabilia? <laughs> you know, so can we have that conversation? Um, I've had hard conversations with women. Um, you know, we had that a young mixed woman who everybody came for when she basically was uplifting her hair type. And then, you know, I was like, let's have a hard conversation about the fact that we uplift that hair type, but then we have a problem when, when that person is uplifting the very thing that we, we covet. Um, when I talked to men and I made that video, male hypocrisy, yes, it's your fault. And the men came up fully acknowledging their hypocrisy, but also trying to make it make sense at the same time. You know, I just, you know, my vibe is how honest of a conversation can we possibly have on any given subject? How real can we keep it on any given subject? 
And I challenge myself and I challenge you guys to just keep it a thousand. Like the truth is very uncomfortable sometimes, but that doesn't mean that we duck and dodge the truth or we get hostile every time somebody says something that challenges our ability. Because in the Black community, pride is like a really big thing and image is a big thing. And anything that wounds our pride or affects our self-image we are resistant to. And that is really preventing us from being able to do some much needed work in the community. So I did not do this live to be nasty. I just want to throw that out there. That was not, that was not what I was, that's not what I was on. Um, hi, Octavia. Hi, can hi. you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, do I sound clear? Am I clear? Mm-hmm. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, so I, wanted to respond to the young woman that was up here previously. Um, I raised my son um, as a single mother. His father was absent. So I had to utilize the community as far as that male um, affirming that he needed. There were times where I wanted to overly mother. And my son actually had to tell me, mom, I got it. It's okay. And I was like, okay, all right. So you have to be really in tune with your children and be uh, involved and, and, and understand when there's a time to step in and when there's a time to step back, especially with boys. Um, He's an adult now. He lives on his own, he graduated college. I'm very proud of him. He's an exceptional young man. Um, and it was difficult, but I had to set boundaries. Um, I come from a working middle-class family um, who also helped me. Um, his first introduction to the world is pretty much his inner circle, which is myself, my my parents, his grandparents. So when I didn't I didn't know any different until he had a friend spend the weekend with him, and he remarked that, "Wow, it's so quiet here. Nobody's yelling at each other." And I was puzzled. I'm like, "Huh? Okay." But that was my introduction to, okay, so this is, this seems to be common in his household, but it's not so much here. And I was still pretty young at that point, and I didn't know that that was different dynamics in different black households. Because, you know, all skin folk ain't kin folk. You heard that saying before? Yeah. And that was a shock to me, because I was pretty much encased in this um, world of people who got up and went to work every day, didn't make excuses, understood the assignment, went out there, did what they had to do. And so it was a learned behavior that was just passed down, unbeknownst to me really, but it, mm -hmm. it was in, within his inner circle and inner space. So, mm -hmm. It really has to be demonstrated, um, not just spoken to, but demonstrated and, and seen for them to pick it up and, and, and want to uh, adhere to it on their own. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that um, because like with the yelling thing, because as women, there are a lot of men who are like highly emotional and um, I personally, like I, and I've said this on this channel, I fear a man that's very emotional because that means he lacks control. And like my safe place with men is that, not that they don't have feelings, but that they have self-control, a self-control that honestly, you know, as women with hormone fluctuations, with like our general emotional state. And I don't say that to be ne negative. Like I said, our emotions are what make us great mothers, great lovers, great comforters, very empathic. But our emotions are also when there's nobody there to be a check and balance 
are what make us scream and holler, make us, you know, make us get emotional and then throw things or get emotional and kind of close up. And um, that behavior unchecked with a child can be very difficult. And then you have men that learn that kind of unhinged, unchecked emotionality. And because there's not a man present to balance out that woman's energy, and because there's not a man present to demonstrate a different way of being, then you end up with a boy that is highly emotional, who then grows into a man that is highly emotional. This is something that I said over in the manosphere. And I think a lot of women gloss over it because then it's like, oh, so then it's our fault. It's our fault that these men are growing up this way. And it's not our fault per se. It's the fault of the lack of a two parent household, like the lack of a father being there, the lack of a man being able to be the check and balance for female energy, because, you know, a lot of time men will be like, you know, calm down. And that's like a triggering thing for us. But it's them like balancing our energy. Or like in my household, I I will yell. I'll be like, stop that, you know, and I'll yell it from like two rooms away and things like that. Or I'll see something and I'll think it's egregious and I'll be like, what are you doing, right? And that's like, without the balance there for my husband, it'd be like, walk upstairs, right? And things like that. Or without, like you were saying, your, your son coming to you and like, saying something. My children came, to, well, feel comfortable and, and I make it comfortable for them to come to me and say, oh, well, we don't like this or, and I try to hear them. Um, but that's like, those are all skills and it helps to have like that male balance. Like a lot of my emotions get checked because Mr. has so much emotional self-control. And then that helps me, you know, level it out. And I also help him be more tender, be, you know, more emotional, be able to emote more so that he isn't like a tin soldier, which is what the opposite kind of thing that can happen to a man is he becomes like a tin soldier where his emotions are eight levels buried, you know, under, <laughs> under the dirt in, in a metal box somewhere. So um, I'm glad that you said that. Cause I think it's so hard for us as, mothers because we're so heavily criticized and so many women are doing it on their own to be honest about our shortcomings because we fear that somebody will use that as fodder to then say that the ills of the community just speaking of black people or the behavior of our child falls solely on our shoulders and our lack of ability to be good mothers get the package from outside for me and I, I just think we have to step away. That goes back to like not being in delusion, right? We can't ignore where we need to improve as women for fear that it will give people who are have bad intentions the ammunition they need to, to harm us or insult us or put us down. We have to be brave when we have these conversations and, and drown out the noise and only focus on people who are about what we are about, which is being honest so that we can improve together and improve the state of our people and get our people out of, because the, the world does not respect us and none of us are safe. Women and children are not safe in a world that does not respect us and in a world that does not respect black men. So our collective thing should be that blackness is respected so that we can be safe and so that we can progress and grow in power and strength like as a community. Right. There was um, a point in his adolescence where I understood that he would be okay because he didn't have his father in, in his life. Um, you know, I, t I said I had to utilize the community, my, my um, male relatives to step in. And so I worried about him, um, if he was going to be able to interact in this world with men and know how to deal with men directly. And I got my question answered when my son came to me. He called me at work. He said, he was so upset. He said, Mom, 
Uh, someone stole the tires off of my bike. This is a brand new bike. I just bought him for his birthday about a week earlier. And I said, oh, no, okay. Um, he's like, I know who took them. I know who has them. I know where they are. I said, okay, Brandon, um, when I get home, you know, we're going to go to the police. We're going to fill out a report. We're going to do this. We're going to A, B, C, D. He was just like, I can go get them right now. I said, no, let's do this properly because the boys that he knew did it were twice his size, and I didn't want him to get hurt. So I got home later that evening. I said, okay, Brandon, let's, let's go to the to police station. He's like, that's okay. I got my tires back. I said, what? He's like, I went to get them. I said, what happened? He said, I went over there. I confronted them. I told them if they didn't give me back my tires immediately, that I was going to have them arrested and put in jail. Now, I know my son, okay? That's not how he said it. But the fact remains is he handled it. He, uh, he got his tires back, and the situation was rectified without me stepping in. So I was like, okay, I think he's going to be all right. <laughs> Yeah, because we can over worry as mothers. And I think it's good that you have that experience with him because we also have to have faith in like our son's ability to navigate situations because the world is not kind to men. Like a lot of, and real deal, I'll come to you right after I say this. Thank you so much for being patient while we are talking. But, um, you know, yesterday, um, one of the reactions one of the brothers had was, you know, black men, they have to like basically jump through hoops to get basic levels of respect. And I was like, yeah, I feel that, you know, that's true. I said, but the reality is that we live in a patriarchy men in general, the world is less sympathetic to them than they are to women and children and the elderly. Right. Um, women, children, and the elderly, the hierarchy of society is children are the most protected and sympathized with, then, you know, it's the elderly neck and neck with women, right? And then men, you guys run stuff, basically. So people have the, less, the least amount of empathy toward you. And I'm not saying that that's right. I'm just saying it's the reality. And then there's a hierarchy among men. And the reality is that Black men are at the bottom of the totem pole of that hierarchy. And I'm not, again, saying that's right. I'm just saying that's what it is. So we know that some people are given a base level of respect, like a white man talking to a lot of people is like gold. Or as Mr. says, the idea that white ice is cooler, you know, is, is a normal thing. Like whiteness is automatically given validity based on just whiteness. Um, and no, black people are at the bottom of the totem pole and at the bottom of the hierarchy of femaleness, black women are at the bottom of the totem pole, at the hierarchy of uh, maleness, black men are at the bottom of the totem pole, and heavy is the head that wears the crown. More so when you are at the top echelon of the social hierarchy, meaning you're a man, but you are at the bottom of that totem pole of, pole of male hierarchy. I can't imagine what that's like. That's gotta be very frustrating, right? As a woman, I can maneuver around and kind of adjust my positioning in the female hierarchy with my femininity, with my beauty, with my resourcefulness, things like that, right? With my ability to engage men and like having wisdom in that, I can usurp, right? The feminine hierarchy as an individual, right? But as a man, the way that men measure against each other, that is much more difficult. But the demands of women on men do not change regardless of where a woman falls on the hierarchy. And the judgment of a man's value, worth, and credibility are universal regardless of where a man falls on the male hierarchy. So that I definitely believe does read as we are baseline not respected we have to produce more, do more to be respected. And um, it, it, it's one of those things where it kind of is what it is. I, I feel like 
it's, we can be frustrated with that. I could be frustrated, you know, that attractiveness is a measure of a woman's worth, right? The baseline is, is she attractive? I can be as frustrated about that if I want. I can talk about all the other qualities about myself that are, you know, also relevant, but it will never change the baseline, right? Doesn't mean all those things aren't assets, means the baseline's not moving for me. And I think men have to accept that too. Like the baseline's never gonna move for you. It's really not gonna move when we are black. So, you know, sometimes we just have to accept reality for what it is. And I guess my point in saying that is that it's good that he has that experience and it's good we allow those experiences because the baseline won't move for our boys and it's not going to move for us as, as mothers or as women. Hey, Real Deal. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for being patient. I oh. apologize. <laughs> Okay, so when it comes to everything, uh, thank God I had my father and my mother. Thank God I wasn't coddled because now I see that a lot of the dudes that I went to high school with, so I'm, I'm close to 30, a lot of them dudes still act like they're 15 and it's because they've been coddled. It's because of either the father figure that was there wasn't someone that he respected or a situation of the mother can't put fear of God to him where he will be able to respect. And when it comes to the situation of the black men argument, a lot of black men, we do a terrible job in the pointing of who is supposed to be the chief. And we got the wrong Indians. <laughs> so we, we, we have the, both the wrong chief, the wrong Indians, and the wrong mindset of certain things. Now, uh, when it comes to black men and their victimhood, oh man, it's all over the place, he, uh, Irene where dudes that you've talked to, you've clearly either sent them overconfident, where they say, oh, we ain't broke, or too overly victimhood-ish, where they say, well, it's the feminism uh, fault. The government take kids out. You know, not enough accountability, not enough initiative, too reactive. And I I'm just going to be honest, man. You know, a lot of the dudes is dealing with both low IQ problems and lack of self accountability, but I'll, I'll mute up. So I'm not pulling any punches because I've, you know, I'm a realtor, help people get their credit repair, help dudes do all this stuff. But sitting with maybe seven out of 10 black men, it's going to be disappointing. Three out of the 10, they're actually dudes that have a true mission plan and not just scatter brain all over the place, worrying about the wrong things all the time. So but I'll mute up. Yeah, the, it's interesting you say that because I told you guys I had an ongoing discussion with a patron of mine um, for a couple of years. And some of the stuff he said as a black man, like it was hard for me to accept. Um, he kind of was saying the same thing you said, which is if I sit down with other black men, because we were like what really stuck out to me was like the black power structure. And this, this idea that I'm like, for myself, as a Black woman, and for Black women in general, regardless of who you choose to marry or reproduce with, it is a benefit to Black women and children for Black men to be respected, right? And even feared, to some degree, to have power. Because right, wrong, or indifferent, when the men of a community are respected, that protection and that elevation automatically transfers to the women and children in the community. Same way if a man is not respected, that disrespect and that lack of safety then is translated to the women and children in the community. So I really push for um, Black men to establish a place that demands respect and harnesses power and build infrastructure because I recognize that my black skin is going to allow me to benefit from their social progress as a collective, right? Now, <clears throat> the brother that I was talking to, man, I really want to share our conversations. I got to get up with him and ask him if I block out his name, is it okay? Because you have to read it to believe it. 
He was saying he did not want black men to have power. That he absolutely didn't feel safe with the idea. He essentially did not feel that black men just as a collective um, had the sense or, you know, the purpose of responsibility to do that, that he would actually be in more danger as a black man if black men had power. Now, this is a financially accomplished, intelligent black man. And I, to hear a black man push back against me about black male leadership, that was very difficult for me to accept. I never saw that coming. And I appreciated his honesty, but it's not much different about what you're saying, which is I have myself together, but I know that if I sit down with my peers, that's not the overwhelming majority. And I have to say the same thing about Black women. And I said this yesterday when I was on Obsidians, I said the majority of Black men and the majority of Black women are not worth-ish. And I don't say that to put down the Black community. I say that because we keep wondering why we are constantly running into duds, not just in dating, but just in people who have that are on their purpose, people who can hold an intellectual discussion and thrive and enjoy that, people who are, are striving for not just individual progress, but communal progress. And we're like, why, you know, and then of course, people to date, right? People who are dateable with good morals, marriageable. And we're, we're acting like somehow one group of us is so phenomenal and the other group is terrible. And I'm like, no, almost everybody's <laughs> terrible. That's the problem. That's why you're having an issue. Is this is like a universal problem that we're having. Yeah, I, I agree. Because I'm not going to pretend like we're in a good situation. <laughs> right. I'm not just going to pretend. I'm not going to pretend. Because with me... I don't have necessarily a problem with black men leadership for one, my father, someone that I truly respect, someone that after high school helped me get to an apprenticeship, but you know, it wasn't black American apprenticeship. It was, you know, an African collective of people. So when it comes to situations of black men, really black men need to understand that. Can we understand to like each other enough, long enough, where we can get a plan because, you know, we have the Zoolander, you know, we have the Zoolander approach. There can only be one. Uh, then, you know, the collective of black people have the Messiah complex where we choose the wrong one and the Zoolander complex is affected where we have a combination of just bad, how can I say bad, bad movements, just terrible movements that doesn't even help the construct of the family help the aspect of men to be able to toughen up because keep it one on it, keep, keep real with you. We got the softest men in American history, probably world history. And that's not just pertaining to black men, that's pertaining to white, black, Hispanic, Asian, like men in general has tend to be very soft where if something really big happens, you know, we're in a tough spot, but to the point, I don't have no problem of black man leadership as long as the leadership is very, how can I say, cordial, strategic. And, you know, I've done business with black women that was the head of the league, you know, construction owners. And they said the same thing that, you know, we try to get black men and black women on the job, but we, we can't seem to get enough initiatives, enough uh, enrollments on that. So I, I can't blame white people all day. I, I choose not to blame white people all day. Uh, I, don't, I choose not to blame any other group. I don't blame black women for nothing. We, we got to go back to the black men, man, because we are the de facto leaders. The de facto leaders. And, and, and one thing, you know, blaming black women, you know, a lot of black women is saying that, well, we looking up to you. How are we getting blamed? We looking up to you. And if we see you trying to be a rapper, trying to be the celebrity, trying to be seen, trying to be the next trap star, scamming whatever you're doing then you know what else is there to look for but i'm done uh you know what <sighs> the de facto leaders can i was really wanting to make a separate live about this um when i was over on obsidians we were talking about black male protection 
And I was trying, I think I was talking over the heads of the audience, like really over their head because I kept repeating the same thing over and over, but like it wasn't clicking. I was like, the black community, our, our way of thinking is so small and peonic. And I'm not saying that as an insult. I'm saying that as a fact. By peonic, I mean like a peon, right? So we don't think from a leadership standpoint. We think from a peonic standpoint, a peon's standpoint. That's old school. Peon. I haven't heard that since yeah. the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in, this, in this peonic mentality, right, when we talk about protection, we're thinking like, you know, I as an individual, am I going to protect this person as an individual? And I was trying to really get them to understand that protection is a two pronged thing. Protection, um, for example, our military, our police force, they do their job, not because all Americans are people that they like, Right. The government has a police force and the government has a military, not because of the flawless nature of Americans. Right. There are pedophiles in America. There are killers in America. You know, there are domestic terrorists in America. There are all kinds of people in America. But the military, if somebody attacks America, defends the United States, not because of the goodness of the American people, but because a show of power when you control something, when you're staking your claim, like as men, and you're like, this is mine, this is my domain, is that I'm protecting this and it's not even about you, it's about me. It's about the fact that I'm gonna make it clear that, pardon my French, you don't fuck with me. You don't fuck with me, you don't fuck with what I got going on. That's, that's what we're not doing, right? And then, Within that structure, I might have people I'm unhappy with, but my authority and overarching protection provides me with power to then engage in chastisement, aka the police force, of individuals who are disrupting the order of what is mine. And so protection in one regard is a separate thing when we're talking community when we're talking na nation building, when we're talking not being a peon, right? When we're talking about operating in power, protection is a thing that establishes power. It is not about the goodness of the people you're protecting. It's about the establishment, the protection of your power, the establishment and protection of what is yours, what you have control over that you have dominance. And then the second level of protection is the stuff that we're always talking about on Black YouTube, which is, can sassy mouth get me to punch somebody in the face on her behalf? Is the unruly woman <laughs> going to get protection from X, Y, Z? I'm not against an individual man being like, well, I told you not to wear that. So when he grabbed your butt, you should have changed your clothes before you left the house. I'm not about to cover you if you're going to wear a hose uniform after I told you not to, right? Or I've said repeatedly to not see that man. If he popped you in the face, I could beat him down. But because you keep defying me and going to see him, you go ahead and you just suck up that busted lip. That is a peonic level of protection. And I was trying to get them to understand like, manhood, our community is not respected and black men are not respected. When we talk about the violation of women, this goes back to, um, this goes back to the slave narrative that I was giving when they were talking about the patty rollers. It was by Lewis Clark, not the explorer, but the enslaved man who spoke in an abolitionist meeting. And he was speaking about the patty rollers and he was saying, and this is a direct quote. He said, a slave can't be a man. And I built a whole live around his, um, his, his speech that he gave at that abolitionist meeting. And I read what he said, right, about Black manhood. And he said, a slave cannot be a man. And he used the example of the blatant violation of women 
to show that man that you are not a man in your face. When I know that this is your woman, I will violate her and you will sit back and you will watch it. And he talked about how those patty rollers did, how they intentionally targeted homes where they knew women were engaging black men, black women and black men. And they violated the women in front of the men to reestablish their dominance over those men. It was men violating women and violating children to show dominance over other men. So when we are getting out of a peonic mindset, protection has nothing to do with the worthiness of women and children has nothing to do with the worthiness of women. When women who look like you are violated, so I, I was thinking about this. Gosh, I really wanted to do this as a separate live. I was like, imagine a room, and in the room there's a bunch of men, and there are two black men in the room, and everybody else is white or white Asian, like they have white skin, right? And they bring in 10 women, and one of those women is black. And every woman in that room is treated with, you know, she's, she's given food, she's laid down on a sofa, she's being fanned, she's being treated beautifully. And then they begin to gang rape and beat the Black woman. And there's two Black men in that room. Do you think the violation of this random Black woman who looks like you, that no men, no man in that room is looking at you thinking this is a failure of your manhood to have a female that looks like you getting gang raped and beat right in your face and you're just sitting around and watching it. You're just letting this go down. You think that that doesn't affect how all of these men with white skin view you? And that's kind of the conversation we're having. It's not your, your protection because they were like, you know, husbands protect their wives, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that's so base level. That's so peonic. When we talk about power structures and establishing power to have women and children that look like you protected is a show of force. That's why the Ku Klux Klan was stringing Negroes up. That's what lynching was all about. It was about establishing a hierarchy of power. And it seems like everybody understands that that kind of coercive force, the fact that people know you're willing to use coercive force, because somebody accused me, they said, oh, I remember back in the day, I remember when I was accused of this many, many years ago. They're like, Irene told Black men to start a race war, which I never said no such thing. This is back when O'Shea first approached me and he's like, come be on my channel. And I did say something that a lot of men, so I know the person that made this comment has been following me for years, because this was like four or five years ago, that this commenter was talking about. I was like, dang, you're stalking me, dude, because this is crazy. Um, and it was not that I was saying start a race war. I was saying, you understand, read my, go watch my Cognitive Liberation series, y'all. Some things are what they are. The, the respect of what manhood is, is obtained and has historically been obtained in certain ways. And so when we are talking about protection with a peonic mindset, it is frustrating because whether I like it or not, when a black man is walking down the street and Society and the world thinks nothing of him. It affects me as a woman. My safety, my children's safety, our safety is dependent on society respecting the men that look like us. And that may not be fair, but it is reality. And so when men say, I don't care to have any respect in that regard, or I think I can garner that respect without doing all the things that every other group of man on the totem pole above me has done to get that respect, that is a frustrating thing. Because it's like, no, sir, all the other guys are doing it. Why do you think you're going to garner what they have without doing what they did? That doesn't make sense.
So essentially, Irene, black men have to start respecting themselves. And by extension, black women will benefit from that respect that they have in themselves. They have to first establish manhood and understand as a collective, we need to stand 10 toes on our manhood in our square. That is what is lacking in, in you have it on some individual level, but as a collective, it's like you said, if all of society thinks nothing of you, then they're not going to think of anything of your offspring. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I hate how people like to spin it and said, so what is this respectability politics? Because that's the main thing that people in real life, <laughs> when I say stuff, start saying something like this, they're going to automatically think respectability politics. They're going to say, damn, you sound like Bill Cosby pulling up your pants, which, you know, pull up your pants. Like, you're you 47 years old. Uh, but me, I don't want to sound nihilistic, but boy, it's going to take two or three generations. <laughs> two or three generations after my generation to be able to figure something out. The dudes need to be more involved, but when you, when you got dudes that's been coddled, lack of self accountability, no fear in their heart, don't respect authority, uh, it, it's just going to be a whole a, a big problem. Because to be honest, I respect everybody, men and women, but boy, I do not respect no nigga. I'm just gonna keep it, keep it 100 with you. A nigga will rob my mama house, my grandmama house, and literally get nothing. Get nothing in return but bullets and gun smoke. And really, it, it's because of the, that element, that criminal element. Yeah, that's that's the majority of it. But we don't want to talk about that. And I was looking at one medium post, how some lefty was trying to say that, oh, uh, the the divestment space is nothing but alt-right. I'm thinking some ahead now, I don't agree with everything that the rest would say, but I do agree on the aspect when there's a situation of a black woman getting knocked off every, what, every hour or every five hours. And when somebody brings it up, that's considered now using racism, white racist talking point, white supremacist talking points. And that just shows you that you got a lot of dudes and he was a black author mind you so i'm gonna put that link in the chat before i leave though but when you got people that says we need to be protected we need to start having our second amendment we ain't necessarily falling back on no man but we ain't gonna let the man get us then it becomes racism i'm like man so it seems like you <laughs> they, they just want motherfuckers to be sitting ducks didn't mean to curse but i kind of look at that like man i got a baby sister man i got a baby sister and I, I, I refuse to allow my sister to just to go with, how can I say, uh, male identified jargon that will eventually lead to her own demise. Nah. And a lot of dudes know this. That's why a lot of dudes say, no, don't trust them. These dudes ain't no good. Because they know. They just don't want it to be displayed on the media standpoint where you got the sin Gs of the world that are uh, going on their head. They just want it to be quiet just kept under the rug but i'm done yeah let's keep it a thousand about that too because when we talk about like you're like you know i have a baby sister something else that i brought up when i was over at obsidians is respect of women is about respect of the man so like let's say a, a, a somebody's wife walks in the room and you guys are talking you know like men you guys clean that up real quick right but that's not out of respect for her. That's out of respect for her husband, right? You're showing your respect for him by respecting his woman. So when we talk about a society where men are like, I will respect my woman, my sister, my daughter, my wife, right? I'm protecting her. That's where it is. Then what you're saying is when your wife, your daughter, your sister, when they go out into the world, if, 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 if this is really the mentality we're going to have, every single man 
doesn't give an F about her. And you can't watch her 24 seven. You can't protect her 24 seven. So what black men are essentially saying is we're on code with not giving a dang about your daughter, your, your mother, your wife, right? If you aren't actively in my face, then I don't care. Somebody could snatch your daughter up and do whatever they want to to her. And it's nothing. Well, in a world like that, and this is why men establish militaries, men establish penal systems, men establish police forces, and then men work in those things. That's who makes up most of the military, the police force, all of, you know what I'm saying? The penal system, it's a bunch of men. Because it is men's way of letting it be known that in our society, you will respect what is ours. Let no mistake be given, we care about you disrespecting what is ours when it is not in our presence. So to have a conversation with men who don't understand that basic concept is very disturbing and scary because this is literally how the world works. Mm-hmm. I, I don't disagree at all. I don't disagree at all. Cause boy, when, when you got the barbershop talk and you got just a whole bunch of dudes where if something comes up, when it pertains to a black woman, motherfuckers may look at it, may, may talk about it for five to 10 minutes, but if it's, if it's some dusty ass junkie that we got to defend, then they all head for it. I'm like, wow. So we, <laughs> we give the junkie quote unquote, the junkie brother, all of sainthood, but we're not giving the same energy when it comes to someone that could potentially be your kinfolk. That's why I kind of look at this community stuff is crazy. <laughs> you know, this is just all a front, just, I guess, to look good for other groups, the, the fake solidarity, to show other groups that we we can get along but i'm literally inherently i'm i'm literally inherently convinced that <laughs> we are so divided that like uh imo said on the chat that respectfully maybe it's just time just to be able to move on we can't wait for nothing and i don't disagree I don't disagree because we, you know, the media machine, it's not like any brothers that's in the entertainment industry that's trying to take over the media machine to, to put favorable positions where we don't have drill rap and just genocidal music being pumped out to our 10, 15, 20, 30 year old, in the, you know, 20 year old youth and young and old, old, younger adults. Because, dude, like the media got a vice grip on a lot of stuff where even if we did have dudes that were doing the right thing, as long as those dudes that do the right thing choose to be in the sidelines and not take over the image aspect and be real honest when it comes to the image. But we, we're not gonna be honest because the honesty seems like that, oh, you pointing out the worst of us. No, we're pointing out a problem that hurts the best of us. Because rest in peace to Paul Silas, a 79 year old black man that was a multimillionaire got murked off in Chicago by a 16 and 18 year old black kids. That is some bullshit. Someone that was a, a elderly man getting murked off at night. That's why I said, man, they can bring stop and frisk law and order, uh, upgrade 5150, 10 and two, three, three strikes law. I'm to the point where man clean the streets. Clean this, bring Clinton back, bring the streets, clean up the streets. Because Jesus, because we got too many black people that are doing the right thing that get murked off with no motive. That's, that's some bullshit, but I'm done. No, I mean, I agree. The and, and this idea that it's a small, here's the thing. I'm not going to say most black people are criminals, but what I'm going to say is that we don't address criminal behavior, but we do glorify it a great deal. And in a community where 
we are saying we don't want to take on the responsibility of this is what's crazy to me. Oh, I really, I'm going to make this a separate live. And I'm, when I make it a separate live, I'm going to back it up with some stats and statistics because we can't just talk common sense. Um, but in a community where, and y'all know I am traditional, <laughs> Christian <laughs> and traditional in my views of men and women. Um, in, in a community where we are saying no protection will be provided, not just for women, but just for the community in general, that we don't want rules or regulations to be something that men are enforcing. The men aren't wanting to do it. The women don't want the men to do it, right? They want protection, but they don't want rules and regulations, right? I feel like everybody's talking out the side of their face. Women want protection, but they don't want to, they don't want rules and regulations. Men want submission and cooperation, but they don't want to make the streets safe, right? Making the streets safe means it's safe for everybody. It's safe for you as men. It's safe for the elderly. It's safe for women. It's safe for children. So if we are basically saying, and this goes back to how I started this live with paternalism, the idea that Black people are basically big children who need a paternal figure because we won't do the things that are required to make life functional. And then we sit here among Black people and talk about how we're not willing to do things to make life functional. We sit here and we talk about, hey, I don't want rules and regulations imposed on me. I'm not listening to you. And then on another hand, I don't want to do any protection, <laughs> you know, because you won't listen to my rules and regulations. So because we can't come to a consensus to just be reasonable and sensible, we have nonsensical things going on. We have a very much rogue part of the Black population that is terrorizing the majority of the population. And when Cynthia, Nyla, and I sat down, and the title of the video was very salacious, I think it was, Are Most Men Degenerate? And people were like very upset at the title. But if you listen to the solutions part of that live, what the lady said, and I completed, completely agreed with, is that if we had sense, the white collar black men who are always looking down on the Pookies and Ray Rays, those people who are willing to put in the muscle, if they if those groups of men actually work together, then you would have a crazy thing we call society, where the muscle and the mental join forces and create something cohesive. But rather than do that, the muscle and the mental are constantly at odds. So what we have is two groups of people who are behaving in ways that are ultimately destructive. It is a very difficult situation to be in. It's a very frustrating situation to be in. It's literally what inspired this live is the level of denial. Um, people were like, oh, she's not saying anything. And I'm like, I'm not even frustrated that you're saying I'm not saying anything. I'm frustrated that you truly don't understand the words coming out of my mouth. That is disturbing. That's disturbing. Because I'm not reinventing the will here. I'm not saying anything that's like not literally the society that you're living in. That's not evidenced by how the literal society you live in functions, the way all of history is played out. But it's so above your head. And it's this, and see, this is why people say we have a low IQ collectively, that our IQs are in the dumpster. Because, like, just base level understanding about human nature and how society works, base level understanding about power dynamics is so lost on Black people. We're so focused on who we're going to have sex with, who's nice to us. You know what I mean? We can't even get to the bigger picture because we're so caught up in the minutia of the thing that it is actually 
infuriating. It's infuriating. It's frustrating because like it or not, all of our fates are like intrinsically tied together because of how the world works. That if my people choose to be this remediated, it affects me. It affects my children. It affects us all. And it's too much. Like I can't take it. It's, it's, it, it actually the bane of my existence is our community's inability to just comprehend and move forward based on comprehension. Like th this mess is killing me. So I well, mean, you gotta do. Sorry. What'd you say? No, no, no. Go ahead, Octavia. Um, so Irene, do you think this is willful ignorance that they actually do know the damage that they are doing? Or do you really think they just don't have the cognitive understanding of what it takes to have a community, a functioning community? Oh, Octavia, I'm afraid to say I really don't think they understand. Really? I, yeah. I think... Thank you. Nah, I, I want to believe that. I, I would rather believe they understand, but I don't think that, like literally what we just discussed, the difference between personal familial level of protection mm -hmm. and protection as a concept of power. When I say that the response to that is, a woman shouldn't be protected by anybody but her husband, was literally the response. And I'm like, I'm so, did, am I, am I talking to a brick wall? Do you comprehend, <laughs> do you comprehend the concept of there's levels to this? Like, come on, man. Do we, do we let the old lady get her ass whooped at the liquor store? We ain't going to do nothing. Damn. And then they made it like a black thing. And I was like, the, this universal concept of protection is not even race specific. This is just the way of the world, you know, women and children first, that is a saying for a reason. Men out here doing all these jobs, and I agree, men, it's a thankless task a lot of the time, especially in the age of feminism. But it's like, why are we acting like this is not literally how everybody in the world pretty much thinks? Well, see, there, when I have these conversations amongst my peers, and I, I break it down like this, they agree that these are the issues and the problems but they also have absolutely no foresight to do anything about it. That's why I say it's willful ignorance. You see the problem, but you really just don't want to do anything about it because you're so tied to this victimhood mentality that you, you don't know how to get out of it and you're scared to death to step out of line uh, because you don't want to disrupt the uh, natural order of things of, of how your mind has grouped it together. And it's fear. It's fear. It is we have been beaten into submission to where we will not even think to step out of line or uh, challenge the status quo. Yeah, it's... I, I think fear does play a part in it. Um, so I think it's too I think Some people are just scary. And then I think other people <laughs> are stupid. I think there's two S's in the situation, scared and stupid. I'm scared and stupid. Okay. Well, very programmable because you see all of the rhetoric is pretty much like, they're more like talking point Q, Q, Q cards, more than like a comprehensive, like true chronological order solution to anything and the victimhood comes from the marxist agendas you know we you know black people has literally had their whole history used against them when it comes to staying a victim but i'm done yes yeah i want to clamor to it and, I, and it's i'm not saying we weren't done wrong i'm not saying that no 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 i'm not i'm not saying but, that i'm not saying that not right. at all I didn't, I didn't. I don't want that to be. No, I'm just saying that they're pretty much using past traumas to say, "Come here, come here," and that's where and a lot of the twisted, diverted bullshit, you know, comes in. And at some point, at some point, we have to be honest 
with our role in our own oppression. We have to say, okay, what part did I play in this? Oh, I wish I had a keyboard like in a church to go, damn, damn. (laughs) (laughs) Preach. No, you're right. Keep going. (laughs) What, What part did I play in my own destruction? And that is something that we as a community are not ready to talk about. Because if we talk about it, you know, the debate with um, critical race theory, you know, it it bothers me because it's one-sided. If we're going to talk about it, let's talk about it. But you have on this side of of the Black community, um, they want to mm, control the narrative about it and, and make sure that they stay in that victim role. If we're going to talk about it, talk about it. But we don't want to do that because then that means we're complicit in the situation more so than we are the victim of it. I agree. I agree because a lot of people when it comes to that situation say, well, this is our history. They're trying to block our history. I said, man, so we're going to take on the most defeated, most gruesome part of the history and try to act like that's something to be able to duplicate. If we're gonna, if we're gonna bring up some history, we can bring up the wins, we can bring up the losses, we can bring up the small examples, we can bring up collective examples. But I believe when it comes to that aspect, it should be a never forget. But letting somebody, letting some pasty ass white liberal at that to control that narrative, oh man, y'all are gonna be the most defeated as 20, 30 kids, 20, 40 kids, 20, 50 kids. It's like them recycling a new group of uh, the civil rights, uh, civil rights boomers that's pretty much stuck in the past and just, uh, how can I say, lost, <laughs> lost in the sauce. You know, I, just a new I, form of conditioning. Justin, I want black men to respect themselves and start uh, protecting themselves. It, and by extension, black women will be protected too. So it's not about you feeling like you have to put on a cape and, and protect every black woman. That's not what we're talking about. I just had to say that, Irene, sorry. Yeah, no, I put that comment up because I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, this is a moot point, honestly. This is the definition of a moot point because do we not have a police force because every crime can't be solved or, or, or prevented? Do we not have a military because every single war can't be won? That's not, I, I, maybe we shouldn't wear oven mitts because there's no guarantee we won't be burned every time we put our hand in the oven. Maybe we shouldn't brush our teeth because there's no guarantee we won't get cavities you know, maybe we shouldn't wash our clothes because there's no guarantee. It's just this, we could travel down this. We can't be effective a hundred percent of the time with like anything, but it's ridiculous to do so. So yeah. Well, with me, it's not the aspect of preventing every crime. It's not on a scenario of in Kansas city, if we got two black women missing, or two black women that's reported missing, where are the black men in that that whole little cul-de-sac to say, nah, we gonna help figure it out? And, and somebody would say, well, ain't that vigilanteism? Oh, geez, okay, okay. When, when, you, <laughs> when you come out with a solution that black men has to actually step up forward to the plate to, then we get comments like that. It's, it's like, damn. Because if black men wants to be the leaders, let's do it. Because I know what I'm going to lobby for. You know, when I get my big check, you know, I'm going to lobby for black youth. Because I'm not in the business of, of saving lost men. Lost men and, and women. You know, we got to help the youth because the youth is being bombarded by that TV box and TikTok. You know, but I guess that takes too much initiative. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, man, well, this is sad, man. But, 
I'm going to get, get off of here. I, um, yeah, I was going to ask if you have final words. I'm going to get off of here too, but do you two have anything final to say before we go? Um, just the conversation, it needs to be, um, it needs to be honest. That's, that's all. And honesty, I know this word is tossed around so much to the point it, it's lost its validity. But we need really need to get to the root of understanding how we got here. And if we're not willing to uh, pull the veil back on history and, and address it and say, yeah, we did that. We messed up. That was, that was a misstep. Let's address it. Let's, let's learn from it and not do it again. Simple as that. We're not, we're not there yet. Yeah. I don't when know it comes to my, when it comes to my final, when it comes to my final statements is Irene, thank you. You, you could have easily took my money and say, you ain't coming up here. It's a women panel, <laughs> but I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. And when it comes to everything at hand, you know, men and women, but specifically the women, you know, gun training, please get your gun training, get your second amendment, focus on getting your money correct. And make sure that you have a true recession plan. Make sure that the people that you care about, initiatives that you care about, is, is secured. You know, and we got to put some money up. So I appreciate you. Thank you, Irene. And salute to the chat. I appreciate everybody in the chat. Um, thank you. Have a blessed day. You too. Bye bye. Right. Zone, do you want to say something before I go? Uh, yes. Uh, how are you doing? I, I just wanted to say that I. Uh, I had a un, I had an interview. It was about uh, my experience as, as an autistic, and and as well as uh, uh, really uh, porn. It was uh, I had a it was on uh, soft white uh, underbellies. It's going to be uploaded probably soon. So. You hear me? Um, the debate about, sorry, I was talking. Um, my last and final word is that the debate about poverty and black people is still going on over on Obsidian's channel. And I hope that all those people that are trying to refute me come and watch this video from the beginning. I will be doing a follow-up video just on protection using stats and statistics because we can't just act like we understand reality. Um, but until then, I will talk to you guys later. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Are black people poor? Am I making this up? Um, am I in a gross delusion <laughs> about the state of our community? And do we need to face reality in order to improve our reality? Or shall we just continue on in a deluded state? You let me know what you think in the comment section. And also we're coming to the new year. So I plan to do a bunch of lives and make a bunch of videos. So if there are particular lives that you want or videos that you want, now would be a great time to mention those to me in the comment section. I'll talk to you guys later.